And everybody have a good Christmas? Yeah. Are we ready for an a, a exciting new year? Yeah? 2013 coming up. It's right on our doorstep. Um, my, I don't do resolutions, honestly. I just uh, want to live every day better than the day before, right? Yeah, she said, what's my resolution? I don't, you know, resolve to, uh, let it be resolved that we will love each other more than we did this year. Yeah, okay. Well, my, 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 my passion, though, my plan is always to see the, the, the message go farther this year than the year before. Reach more people, have the truth, uh, open more avenues, uh, knock down more obstacles than, than the year before. And, and if you look at the course of, uh, of what's happened over the last few years, you see it every year. The more doors open, more opportunities. Uh, so the Lord is blessing and hopefully we will see him soon. Um, announcement, um, John's here with us again today. Margaret is recovering well. She is at Health South still, and she uh, will be available for visitors today after three. Got physical therapy a couple times today before three. So, um, but after three today, if you'd like to visit Margaret, she will uh, be glad to see you. And then uh, we're hopeful she's going to come home this week. Aren't we, John? Right. Yeah, so hopefully she'll be home this week. That's exciting. And again, for um, visitors that are with us today, all the materials out in the lobby are free for you to take with you. The most recent edition has been our Modern Medicine Biblical Technology in Your Brain seminar. We also have the Could It Be the Simple Book, the Healing the Mind seminar, the Domestic Violence uh, in the Church uh, DVD. All those things are free. If you're here today as a visitor, just take some with you when you go today. Uh, let's uh, begin class with prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study. We open our hearts and minds, invite you here in your, your presence, your spirit. We ask that our minds will be enlightened, our hearts will be filled with your love, and that uh, we will be uh, empowered with uh, truth, with wisdom, and with energy to, to represent you faithfully uh, on this planet. We pray in your holy name. Amen. We are doing lesson number two in our new quarterly origins, and the title this week is Creation Forming the World. And... The second paragraph uh, in Sabbath's lesson states, some scholars have objected to the idea that God would impose, impose in, in, in quotations, a, a purpose on nature, arguing instead that he simply allowed the material world to, quote, be itself, unquote, and to develop by natural processes supposedly inherent in itself. This is a common theme among those who promote various forms of theistic evolution. Yet such ideas are not compatible with scripture or with the understanding of creation. The universe has no inherent will of its own. The creation is not an entity independent of God, but it, it is instead God's chosen arena in which he can express his love to the creatures that he has made. Any thoughts about that paragraph? Anything jump out at you? Well, the, the, the first thing that jumped out at me was the word impose. <laughs> Is impose a purpose on creation the same, same thing to you as God created creation with a purpose? No. Are those the same to you? No. 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 They're not the same to me either. They felt, felt, just felt a little different. Does impose connote a certain lack of freedom, a certain constraint and or control, almost sounding as if it's a big puppet show? Impose a purpose rather than create for a purpose. Um, so where do we draw the line between God's design, God's parameters for operation, even God's intention and planned purpose for his creation, and the freedom within God's creation that we have? Where's that line drawn? <coughs> Does nature have freedom? Before you answer, you should say, what do you mean by nature? What do you mean by nature? Thank you. <laughs> and, and that's the question. W what constitutes nature? These was word nature. Is it just inanimate material, rocks and, and uh, you know, water and things like this? Or is it also are animals part of nature? Sure. Are human beings part of nature? Part of the natural world? Yeah, okay. So when we talk about nature, do we include it all? When we say, uh, to me, it's very encompassing language, nature. We didn't say inanimate nature. That kind of boils it down to non-living things. But when we say nature, we talk about the living nature too, don't we? Yeah. Hmm. Humans as well. And humans as well, exactly. So do birds have freedom to choose where to build their nests? This is or is God deciding where they build their nests? Birds have Pardon? That's a trick question. Is it a trick question? 
I mean, I got to tell you, I, I get a bird's nest that uh, builds on the top of the arch inside the little little alcove in my house. That, uh, and then the little birds leave their little, you know, blessings there right on the, right on the stoop for everybody to have to walk through, okay? Uh, you know, should I say thank you, God, for having that bird build that nest right there? And, and, and I should not call the workmen to come tear that nest down and get it out of the way? Am I going against the divine will if I, if I do that? Uh, how about a bird that builds? We have, a, we have a place where we have a downspout, and a bird builds a nest in a downspout, which blocks the, uh, the, the flow uh, of water coming there. Should we just say, well, it's God's will that we have an overflow here, and, and we should uh, not, not go against the divine because God wanted him to build it? Is, is that how God works? No. No. Not at all. How about... Does God create an environment, an atmosphere, a design for health and welfare of his creation that is based upon constants, certain protocols, what we might call laws, and then gives real freedom for his creation to operate either in harmony or to abuse those protocols and laws? Yeah. Or, or, is it, or do you prefer God imposes his will upon creation, enforcing things go his way? Because that's what it almost sounds like to me. It says, you know, they're, they're making this argument against theistic evolution, against creation running on its own, that God imposes a purpose. And for me, if you go down that argument, you actually argue for theistic evolution. Because if, if it's true that God imposes a purpose, then why did sin happen? If God's imposing his purpose, why did sin happen? Well, then it must be in his purpose. You see, we had a problem here already. That, that doesn't work for me. So the- theistic evolution has arisen as a construct or an idea as people have attempted to merge the ideas of science with the ideas of scripture or the Bible. But tell me why. Let's go through some reasons. Why is theistic evolution an impossible concept if one deri- uh, to, to derive if one uses the Bible? It's not impossible to derive on your own. But if you, if you insist that, hey, this is, is supported by Scripture, if you use the Bible in the construct, why is it impossible? It implies that God created sin and death. Okay, so she says over here, it implies that God created sin and death. Any, anyone even to flush that out? How, how does it imply that? And if, if he just started out with something and... And we need to speak up today because there's a group meeting over in the uh, next over here. And they got a little, sounds like they got a little PA system going over there. <laughs> Maybe we should get one out here and really mm, turn it on to turn the volume up and see if we can go, right? Anyway, go ahead. Um, evolution in, in any way is starting out with, um, I guess, small stuff and, and growing. But it also is survival of the strongest and, you know, yeah, I'm having a hard time hearing. Y'all having a hard time hearing too? Yes. Uh, so I, I will have to repeat. What she said is that, um, you know, the theistic evolution is based on this idea of the strong, and, and, and exactly right, the strong destroying the weak. I have to kill the weak in my environment in order for my genes to pass along so that my genes will advance the species because I'm stronger than you are. And therefore, if we have theistic evolution, then God is the one who designed death into the system as a means to create life. And you see a contradiction in that? <coughs> yeah, it's, it's, very, it's very contradictory. So in this, in this idea, notice there's other theologies that are out there that put God as the source of death as well. But theistic evolution has death emanating or originating with God, uses a tool by him to promote and advance the species. What, what are some other reasons? Yes. God's portrayed as disengaged, as distant. God is portrayed as, yes, he just wound it up, let it go, he didn't care anymore. So it misrepresents God's character in another way. How about this? According to scripture, days are 24-hour periods. Can evolution happen in 24-hour periods? No. So if, if we use the Bible, then just in its base face value, theistic evolution can't be true because, but oh wait, that's not 24-hour periods. Those are long eons of time being described there. Why is that also not tenable? What was created on day three? Land. Land and? Animals. No, not animals. Plants. 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 What was created on day four? The sun. The sun. So what happens if you create plants and leave them for a million years without a sun? <laughs> There's a problem with that. 
So either way, you've got a contradiction. I think this is beauty, beautiful on God's part because it, 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 it helps us understand that you can't have theistic evolution. Um, let's see, what else? Well, what about this? How did an atmosphere... develop on earth without plants to produce oxygen. An oxygen-rich atmosphere develop on earth without plants. Remember, on day two, we make a firmament. Remember, by the Bible, we got a firmament before, before plants. So how do you get an oxygen-rich atmosphere with no plants to produce oxygen if it evolved on its own? How does that happen? And if there's no atmosphere, and, when, and if the plants evolve first to create the atmosphere, how do plants evolve in a planet where there's high solar radiation because there's no atmosphere to protect from the solar radiation that would destroy life as it, it started to, to evolve? If you already have an oxygen-rich atmosphere, then how does life um, evolve in a high oxidizing environment where oxidation would destroy developing cells? It's like hydrogen peroxide, okay, oxidation. It will destroy the cells aren't going to be able to survive in this atmosphere. High radiation, high oxidation. So how, how does this happen? The problem after problem after problem when you start going down this road of theistic evolution. Can you think of any Bible texts where, that reveal God's foreknowledge in prophesying that people would at the end of time deny creation to teach evolution? Well, I like this text. See what you think. 2 Peter 3, 3 through 6. First of all, you must understand that in these last days, in the last days, something's going to happen, some people will appear whose lives are controlled by their own lusts. They will mock you and will ask, he promised to come, didn't he? Where is he? Our ancestors have already died, but everything sti is still the same as it was since the creation of the world. So notice the first argument. That everything is still going on, the same as it always, that people are born, people die, our ancestors die, nothing changes, just keeps kind of going on. Now listen to what happens next. They purposely ignore the fact that long ago God gave a command and the heavens and earth were created. The earth was formed out of water and by water, and it was also by water of the, of the flood that the old world was destroyed. So here's a prophecy at the end of time. They're going to people come along and say, look, there wasn't any creation. We don't believe that. Things go on like they've always gone. They just kind of go on all the time, just round and round. People live, people die. I kind of hear a prediction at the end of time. They're going to deny creation and what's taking its place. So what's the difference between the theory of evolution and adaptation as God designed life to do. What is the difference? Because when I, when I use the term adaptation, evolution is what will throw right back at me. Well, that's evolution. See, you do believe in evolution. What's the difference between evolution and adaptation? Yes. The adaptation is the wonderful still engagement of a caring Heavenly Father who wants to be able to have his creatures of all kinds um, be able to respond to the variations that have happened around them uh, as a res response to sin or as a response to other things and not have them static. So it is actually more evidence of a loving and engaged Heavenly Father to have that adaptation capability. It are all... I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to play the devil's advocate for a minute. Are all the adaptations that have been happening on planet Earth since Adam sinned part of God's engagement or part of God's disengagement? A lot of disengagement. Okay, so all the adaptation then doesn't necessarily reveal engagement. It's happening because of disengagement, because of our disengagement with him, because of our separation from him. Let, let me go through some examples. Um, well, and the difference between evolution and creation, evolution states there's no God, no intelligent creation, that all these things you see around you are just random, happening chaotically without any purpose, just random forces causing these things to happen. And then creation says that God created the universe and then life and he built life to operate with certain protocols or parameters 
and he did not build us like wind-up toys. This is the deal. He did not build us like wind-up toys, like, like a human builds a toy, winds it up, and then it has the animation and looks alive, but it just does the same thing over and over and over again. You see, God didn't create complex life that is programmed in the genes to do the same thing over and over and again. No, he built us with the ability to make free choices that would actually internally change us physiologically change us neurobiologically. We have new neural circuits developed based on what we do. Example, if you take piano lessons, your brain will rewire and you will develop circuits that you don't have if you never take piano lessons in your brain that allow you to play the piano. If you take language classes, you will develop new circuits in your brain for that new language that you wouldn't have if you, never, if you didn't take that. And on and on we go. Your brain rewires based on experience. Further, down to the DNA level. The choices you think, the things you believe, and I'll give you some examples here in a minute, even the foods that you eat alter how your genes are expressed, which genes are turned on, which genes are turned off. And you pass those genes on to your kids. Example, this is adaptation. So we change neurologic wiring, we change physiologically. You all know this, if you exercise you get more muscles. If you don't, you kind of shrivel up, like me. Um, <laughs> if you, uh, if you, um, you get the DNA changes, you get uh, epigenetic modification, transposons, which are little pieces of DNA, will actually re uh, re be removed and insert themselves in various portions of your DNA, causing DNA sequencing changes. Notice, though, all of the things I'm talking about, this is not speciation. This is not speciation, meaning it's not one species changing into another species. This is adaptation within a species. And that's how God built things to, to do. That you as a human being can do many things to adapt to change. To, you can grow and e evolve. Or you can do things that are destructive and devolve. Depending on the choices that you make. So let's give some examples. How about Darwin's famous finches? And I've got the references in the notes for those who want the notes. The scientific journal references. You know, the old theory that this was based on mutation over millions of years, causing beaks to be different so that some could survive in different environments, some with long beaks, some with short beaks, some with strong beaks, and so forth. You know, the data is very clear. No, no DNA sequencing changes. There are epigenetic modifications that happen within one to two generations based on the need of that new generation and the environment in which they're living, the beak shape changes. Isn't that fantastic? And this is well documented. Now I've got the journal references if you'd like to see it. So, Darwin's finches that he used to prove his theory of evolution, of speciation, actually proves creation. But not all changes since humankind deviated from God's design are adaptive as the beak changes are. How about telomere shortening? Anybody know what telomeres are? Telomeres are the end caps on your chromosomes. Every time a cell divides, if you remember your mitosis, uh, when a cell divides, it, it needs a new copy of your DNA for each new cell that's made. So it will copy itself and give a, a new copy of its DNA to the new cell. And if that cell's divided, it'll copy itself again and again and again. The telomeres are the ends of the chromosomes, kind of like the little plastic caps on your shoelaces. The little plastic caps on the end of the shoelace, that's your telomere. And as those shorten, the ability of the cell to divide is impaired. And if they get short enough, the cell can't divide anymore, which means you, you age and your skin loses elasticity and you get wrinkles and, and you can't reproduce old and dying cells anymore because you can't. And, and, and tell them your shortening happen, happens as we age. So this is not an adaptive change. This is a maladaptive change. How about the epigenetic modification that results from a famine? If a woman is pregnant and happens to be in a famine during her pregnancy and has significant c calorie intake deprivation, then the developing fetus has modification to its chromosomes so that that child will have higher rates of diabetes and obesity than if the mother had normal nutrition during. And the reason for that is that the, the environment is signaling that you're coming into a world with very, very little amount of energy for you to survive on. So we're going to send some instructions to change your metabolism baseline rate down so you can survive with less energy. And then you come into a world in which you have normal food supply and you eat normal amounts of energy, but you are now epigenetically modified to not need that much energy, so you end up with diabetes and obesity. And this has been well documented. It happened with, uh, with the people in uh, uh, Nazi Germany uh, occupation, those people who, who uh, were in a very restricted caloric intake. The kids that were um, born during that time end up with higher rates of obesity and diabetes. 
Um, how about if your mother drinks some alcohol when she's pregnant with you? An epigenetic modification happens such that you will find alcohol tastes better than if your mother didn't drink when she was pregnant with you. So the taste buds get modified. Oh, that, that, doesn't, that tastes pretty good. Why? Signaling happening. The way we're designed, we are designed to create beings in our image. Yes? I learned in my special ed class that's the number one cause of learning disabilities. Yes, number all during pregnancy. Yeah, it is number one cause. Even one drink a week, one glass of wine a week will alter the developing brain and cause uh, cognitive and memory and, and learning problems. But what if the father's an alcoholic, not the mother? Yeah, those actually have impacts too. It's just different because it's not developmental at that time. It'll be in the epigenetic instructions going along rather than the, than the epigenetic and developmental, both. Um, a recent study found that epigenetic modification, get your mind around this one, of how the brain responds to t testosterone may be contributing to homosexuality. <coughs> the female brain... I think everybody knows that testosterone masculinizes and there's a wide range from individual to individual how much testosterone is available in a person's body. Women have testosterone just much less than men do. Uh, and there's a wide range amongst women about what that testosterone is. So it's not just the absolute level of testosterone. The brain itself has to be receptive or responsive to the testosterone. So what they've discovered is that there's an epigenetic marker that women have that suppresses the expression or exp suppresses the response to testosterone so that uh, that testosterone does not masculinize a female brain. Those markers are supposed to be stripped when mama's chromosomes are passed on to her son. But sometimes those markers don't get stripped. And so the son now has a brain with a marker that makes his brain non-responsive or less responsive to testosterone, so the brain doesn't masculinize, it stays feminized. And this is one of the factors in homosexuality. And it, it's reverse in lesbianism, in, in, instead of the gay men and the lesbian, they actually don't get a marker they should have and the brain becomes masculinized. Well, I've got the, I got the reference, the scientific journal reference for you guys in the notes if you're interested in checking that out. One of the factors, it's not the only exclusive factor, there's other vulnerable, vulnerable developmental periods for sexual development as well that's involved. So when Adam and Eve sinned, they actually changed themselves characterologically, but the way God built them he built them with the ability to change themselves physiologically as well, based on their choices. And they were designed to make choices in harmony with his design for life and ever advance in their wisdom, in their perspective, in their abilities, in their knowledge, in their capacity for love, to, to never stop growing and evolving in higher levels of development. But they made a different choice. And they practiced different principles that began changing them in different ways. And, and I'll give you a brain change. As soon as they sinned, instead of their love circuit of their brain interesting at a cortex and um, dorsal lateral cortex being in control, as soon as they sinned, the amygdala took control, which is your fear circuitry, and they ran and hid because they were afraid. And instead of sacrificing self to protect Eve, Adam begins to throw Eve under the bus to protect himself. Fear. There's already so physiologic change already happening within moments of making this change. Sunday's lesson. Do you find this stuff interesting? Yes, yes, yes very much. Sunday's lesson. Um, the top Bible verse at the top it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then in the first paragraph, it, 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 I'm not going to read the whole day, but I encourage you to read the whole day. First paragraph, though, really kind of takes position supportive of, of what we've taken. It says, The Bible starts with the story of creation, and the creation story starts with the statement that God is creator. It then describes the condition of the world when God began to prepare it for occupancy. When the story begins, the planet is already here, but unformed and unfilled, dark and wet. The succeeding verses describe how God first formed the world into an inha inhabitable place and then filled it with living creatures. The text does not tell us exactly when the rocks and water of the earth came into existence, only that the world had not always been suitable for life. So I, they're taking the position 
that Genesis does not describe creation of, our, uh, of, of the universe. It describes terraforming and, our, and creation of our solar system. That is consistent, as we said last week, with uh, Job 38, 4 through 7, where the angels sang for joy when the earth was created. Well, they couldn't sing for joy if they weren't already here. Monday's lesson. It says, Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God divided the light from the darkness and called the light day and the darkness night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. We're all familiar with this passage. What points are being made from the passage? Any points that you want to... What are the possible meanings then to let there be light? What might that mean? I, I got four of them down here. Maybe there's more. <coughs> We're going we're gonna to list them, then we're going to examine which is consistent with the evidence, which has problems. Yes, what are possible meanings? Well, my, my question is, how can, how can we have an evening and a morning without... That comes after this question. That's in the notes. That comes after this question. We're going to get that evening and morning next. Okay. Okay, yes. So let's answer this question first. What does it mean, let there be light? One possible... Oh, go ahead. Let God be here. Okay, exactly. So one, and that could mean two. One is, um, God lives in unapproachable light. As it says in 1 Timothy 6.16, we see in uh, the description of the, of the prophet in vision, Daniel chapter 7, that, that he sits on his throne and flames of fire come out before him, rivers of fire come out before him. So one possible explanation is God showed up and there was light. This is one possible explanation. Another explanation is, and I don't know if you've heard this one, it's the light of truth. God, light is a metaphor for truth, and he says, let there be light, he's beginning to create. And so this is the light of truth that is now being shown, spiritual truth rather than photonic truth. Another possible explanation is it's some form of physical light with photons, heavenly flashlights that God is putting in his workspace. <laughs> and then another explanation that you've heard in here before is that God was actually dissipating a black hole in space in the Milky Way. Milky Way is already here, created the universe billions of years in the past, and then comes to some corner of the Milky Way where there's a black hole, deep void pit in space, and says, let there be light, and the black hole dissipates, and the rest of the light from all the suns of the Milky Way are now on this part of, the un uh, this part of, of, of space. So, as we look at these, po any other possibilities you can think of that could mean let there be light? Well, I have sometimes wondered if it wasn't the starting up of the black hole in our galaxy. They've got <coughs> the light, you know how light comes out of the galaxies like this, uh, when, they're, when they have a black hole in the center? I've wondered if that was the light I was talking about. Hmm. So which do you like best? Less. So let's, which fits the avail available evidence the best and what are the weaknesses of each position? Let's go through them. God is presenting truth um, and, a, a, as an interpretation. Let there be light. It's actually metaphorical for truth. Um, the problem I have with that is this week is about actual physical, the whole, the whole context is about physical, creating, creating a real you know, planet, real suns, real solar system. There's real creation going on here. Um, was God actually creating truth or was he revealing truth? Revealing. Well, who was he revealing it to? There's no human being yet. Angels, John, uh, Job 38. You don't think they already know the truth? It, it, then why did a third of them get deceived by Satan? Well, they were already out of heaven. So, th so there, was, there was a lot of questioning going on. This is, this is, this is what was happening in the context. Is, these, are, these are good points. Um, the text goes on to describe night and day, light and dark, which seems to lean away from a metaphorical toward a literal interpretation. It seems to lean that way. God, uh, God shows up physically. His physical presence is light, and this is what it's talking about. But then again, the context is talking about creative power. And is, God, is God's presence... Which, you know, creating light, or is it just, it just, he just is? Yeah, so it's not creating anything new. Um, hmm. What about, you know, God is making uh, some, some heavenly flashlights for his workspace, lighting up the area here. Um, you know, that's consistent with creating something. It's uh, consistent with a physical light, but there's no biblical or natural world account of some light that we can point to in either the scripture or so that leaves us, one, one, let me get the last one and we'll come to you, James. And that leaves us with the possible black hole theory that they dissipate the black hole and the light of the rest of the suns of the Milky Way are now flowing. And this fits the description of the earth before creation as a deep black abyss in which there was no light. It fits the context of 
Um, God creating something, using creative power to make things happen. It fits the reality of a physical universe and physical light. Uh, and it's uh, consistent, again, with the fact that angels were singing and so forth. Yeah, James, go ahead. Maybe another possibility would be make the distinction between God the Father and God the Son. Because he refers to himself a lot as I am light. I am the light of the world. So let there be light. Is it creating the sun? Some would, some would love that position. There are some that argue that the sun was created. So maybe this is arguing that one interpretation is the sun was created. Jesus Christ, the sun, the light of the world, was created on day one. Maybe not created, but just named. Well, uh, where this is creation week, though. Yeah, that's true. This is creation week. So, but some, there are some would love that position as a possible interpretation. I, I personally don't go along with that one because I think God, Christ always was. Yes. I hope I'm not jumping ahead of you, but it seems that at sin, something happened to the way that people saw and perceived um, because they are now naked where that wasn't perceived before. And when Sister White came out of vision, she always talked about how dark the world was and how light it was in other places. So it could have been, I've wondered about this, I'm hoping you'll give me an answer, but I've wondered that there might have been some kind of actual dissipation or change in that light at sin. I think there was. I, 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 the light that I think you're referring to, though, is the kind of light that Moses had when he came off the mountain and his face was mm. radiating it. <clears throat> At least that my, view, my understanding is the kind of light that we saw described in Acts and Stephen's face, the, the kind of light we see at the Mount of Transfiguration with, uh, with both um, Elijah and Moses standing in that light with Christ. So there is that kind of light, that heavenly light, but that type of light, the kind of light at the burning bush, the kind of light when the, when the temple was dedicated and the priest couldn't enter, it's there for sure, and it was gone after sin, but that light doesn't seem to be quite the same as what we're talking about here, I don't think. Yes? The, the texts tell us that the earth existed as without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Yes. Now, depending on how you want to translate that, how does that fit? That's a literal existence of a literal spatial object yep. with water, without light. How does that fit into your black hole model? Because that existed before light and before the creation. Um, that was the status of what we were on before right. creation. So, so my view is God created the universe with its billions and billions of stars and galaxies and, and so forth. And in one corner of the Milky Way, one little space in the Milky Way was a black hole that at creation week, Christ dissipates and uses the matter pr that he created sometimes billions of years in the past yeah. the, to create the earth and the sun and the moon and stars of our solar system, Venus, Mercury, and Mars. Um, so back to the Russell's question now. What do you think the idea of God dividing the light from the darkness is calling the light day and the darkness night? What does this mean so that evening, morning, and first day, yet the sun of our solar system wasn't created until day four? <coughs> Any thoughts about what that means? I had a couple of thoughts. One, who was Moses writing to? Was Moses writing the scripture for the angels who saw creation week? No, he's writing for us post, not just post creation week, but post sin. And post 400 years of slavery and all these other things. So, one explanation is, Moses wrote it this way because he wanted people to have absolute clarity that these were normal 24-hour cycles. He wasn't writing for the science of day and night, but he was writing for the idea that, hey, th th what we call evening and morning, a 24-hour period, that's how long this took. And he's, this was one explanation. Another explanation was what was suggested earlier, that God's presence was actually physically here creating and as we see described everywhere in scripture where God shows up, he's brilliant and the New Testament says in the new heaven and the earth there'll be no need for the sun to light the place because God's presence will be his light. So God is, is physically here somewhere in proximity to earth and the earth begins, as soon as it begins spinning on its axis, it's got a relationship now to the brilliant God and there's an e and rotating at the same rate, it's going to take 24 hours to rotate in relation to God who's brilliant and God is acting as a physical light source uh, once the earth is spinning on its axis, and so it took 24 hours to go around. Still, still, still same thing. These are two possible explanations. I saw a couple of hands. Kim? Yes. Was he not creating the first calendar for man? Wait, I guess we'll have to check with Hallmark. I don't know. <laughs> Basically, how would we know? No, he, you know, calendar, I don't, I don't know about calendar, but... Um, Michael? The, 
Yeah, yeah. Me measurements of time began, yes. Okay, and in a linear existence. Linear time is, is, is happening, and he is now rotating the earth at a certain rate, creating a certain time from, from light to darkness, and it's being described here. And so this is another explanation that what's being described is the speed of the rotation of the earth. The earth rotates at a certain constant speed, and that's what's being described. Okay, all right. So let's go on to Tuesday's lesson. <coughs> it says, and then God said... Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it, be, let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made a firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And so it was. And God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. What do you think about this? What's important about this? The waters were divided from the waters atmosphere. Okay, there's an atmosphere in between. This is important, sure. Um, does it give us any insight into the condition of the earth today and how we can understand geology and the dating of the earth? Does this, this passage give us insight into that? And if so, how? Well, number one, it provides a sound basis for the biblical flood story. We've got a water above the earth. Where's that water now? <coughs> It's not above the earth anymore. It's down below the earth. Yes. Yeah. 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 But yeah, the poles. I mean, simply before the earth was straight up and down, and there was no hot or cold spots. It was the same temperature all over. And the simply at the end of the flood, in order to collect the waters, all you got to do is tilt the earth, and that's exactly what happened. Waters collected this frozen ice at the north and south poles. Yeah. So there. So we have this this water above atmosphere, water on the earth, seas, lakes, rivers, and so forth. And then, so the water above the earth right now, before the flood, uh, not only does it give us an explanation for the flood and understanding how some of the massive geological things like the Grand Canyon and some of these things have formed with this water, um, but it gives us insight into not having confidence in C14 dating. C14 dating is based on a premise that the amount of C14 in our environment is the same in past history as it is today. But this tells us that C14, by the way, is carbon-14, and it's made out of uh, solar radiation interacting with carbon. If you have a, a water layer, and water, water is an extremely efficient, extremely efficient absorber of solar radiation, um, the water in our current atmosphere counts for about 0.33%. 0.33% of the atmosphere is water. But it absorbs 70% of the solar radiation. <laughs> 0.33% of the atmosphere is water, absorbing 70% of solar radiation. So imagine with a water layer that's no longer there, it was very protective, and there would be very little carbon-14 in the atmosphere. So anything that lived prior to the flood uh, that we now sampled would have a starting point with much less C14, would appear tens of thousands of years older than it actually is. Yes, Michael. Yeah, I was also just going to point out that with that, you know, I've seen the computer model, a very advanced computer model, we would have, it would have had much, we would have had uh, heavier gravity on the Earth, and larger things like insects and larger animals not only would have been possible, they would have been probable. Yeah, well, so the next question then, do you imagine this water above the Earth had some type of a circulatory pattern to it? like the oceans do? Or was it just static, frozen like a glass? Or do you think it moved? And do you think that this water layer above the earth, as Michael was suggesting, would have affected our atmosphere in ways that, that, uh, that is different than it is today? Or do you think back then, with this water layer above the earth, there would be elevations you'd go to where a, a human couldn't breathe anymore? Or do you think you had, with this canopy of water, it allowed for higher concentrations of oxygen where the, that oxygen did not dissipate out into space. So you didn't get a thinning atmosphere at higher elevations. You also have a more even temperature. More even temperature because the radiation would be think, the radiation hitting at the at the um, the distribution the flow of hydrodynamics will have a flow of, of heat and cold, so it eventually over time you'll have a human distribution of temperature. Well, and this is the point. So the, the, the solar radiation heats the water that is uh, you know, more at the equator, but then that water moves. That water circulates and it takes the heat, just like the Pacific Ocean takes heat up to the North Pacific and you've got palm trees up in, um, was it Victoria? Yeah, because this, 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 this heat is being... So how about this happening above the Earth? 
and then this, this water layer allowing for higher concentration, so at elevation you don't get the lower oxygen. Then could that mean that, that birds could fly to higher elevations than they can now? Was it possible? Do you think, just, just, we're just, just using our sanctified imagination now. I don't have any science for this. I don't have any uh, biblical text for this, but I'm just thinking. Do you think that the, uh, before the flood, that the, uh, the animals were, were as, as we have, have humans described living 800, 900 years of age and being much more vital and strong, do you think animals were, were more vital and strong before the flood? And, and, and is it possible then we had, we had flying animals that could fly? And then, just like some birds now will dive into the ocean, we're, we're maybe animals flying and going into this water layer and out above. And, and if they did, would it cause shimmering uh, ripples through it with the sun hitting? And imagine the kaleidoscope of colors that you would see on Earth as the interaction between the sun and the ripples of the, of the animals interacting with the, and the flow and the currents. I mean, can you imagine this? Is it possible? I, I, mean, I, 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 I just think it would be fantastic. Yes. And also, in the same model, the, the, C, the CO2 concentration would be so, so much higher that the rainforest of today would almost would, would be nothing compared to the lushness of the, of the greenery and the, and the plant life that was. Well, the CO2 would be higher because? The would be higher. The CO2 would be Why would the CO2 be higher? It would just have a higher partial pressure. Yeah, but where does the CO2 come from? If you have increased plant life, you'd have decreased CO2. You'd have decreased CO2. You'd have decreased CO2. Yeah, and, 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 but CO2 comes from? Respiration. Respiration of? Animals. Animals. So maybe we had a very, very high animal population on the earth, but we didn't have a high human population on the earth. So um, anyway, I like this vision, this idea. Uh, just let your imagination play with that. Imagine what it might have looked like to, uh, to look into the sky and, and how the sun might have caused, uh, uh, you know, what sunsets might have looked like. And I think rainbow kaleidoscopes going through. And I mean, it's pretty cool. Um, all right, Wednesday's lesson. We'll get maybe some other cool imaginary things going go along here. Wednesday's lesson, top section. It says, try to envision the incredible creative power God, uh, uh, of God as he is doing... Um, that which is described in these various texts. And certainly creation was a mighty display of power. We, you know, we've talked in here before, if we take a few grams of matter and we, we take that matter and we turn that matter back into energy, we call that a nuclear explosion. And that's a lot of energy for a little bit of matter, right? That's just a couple grams. How much energy to create the whole world? How much energy to create the solar system, the sun, and our solar system? This is a lot of display of energy, and it's happening in what context? What's in the universal context? What's transpiring in the universe the week God comes to create Earth? A war. What kind of war? Was it a physical might war? A war in heaven over what? Truth. Over truth, over focused on what? Character. On God's character. So basically, can you trust God? This is the deal, isn't it? Yeah. Satan is trying to undermine, Lucifer is trying to undermine beings' confidence or trust in God. This is what the war is over, right? You can't trust him. Now, do you think Lucifer got up in heaven and said, guys, I I've discovered something. God actually is powerless. He's got no power. I'm actually stronger than him. I, I, heavenly, uh, heavenly arm wrestling right now. I'm going to show you. i got more power. Do you think this is what happened? No. Do you think there was ever an allegation from Satan that God has no power? No. Never happened. It was never about power. Or at least not who has the power. It was about the use of power. God has the power. I never said he didn't. You can't trust him with it, though. He abuses it. If you don't do what he says, he'll hurt you. He'll kill you. We don't have freedom. Just pretends to give you freedom. You, you ask questions. I start asking questions. Look, I'm not allowed. I'm not allowed in those councils. Michael gets to go. I don't get to go because I, I ask. I ask too many questions. It's like that teacher that tells you to put your hand down. I got, I got that a lot. That. Too many questions, Tim. Put your hand down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so and so that's what he's doing. No no more questions around here. And, and if you ask any, you're going to get in trouble. And so, God, not only 
declares the truth because he is the source of truth. Then he begins to give evidence and, and he begins to create day one, day two, day three, all the things. And you can see the intelligence that's in heaven going, wow, can you, can you see? What, what, what did God do today? Look, what do you think he's going to do tomorrow? I mean, imagine if you were one of those angels in heaven, how incredible this would have been to watch this transpire. Would you have been excited to see what's, what's, what's going to happen tomorrow, guys? This is exciting. And so if you're Lucifer, he's going, oh man, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. Uh, I, I can't do that. Uh, oh boy, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I know. Guys, I never said he didn't have power. He's trying to intimidate you. See, he's flexing his muscles right now. He's trying to scare you. He's trying to get you to believe. He's trying to, he's trying to get you to conform out of threat because, because what he's saying right now is, if you don't do what I say, I can wipe you out and I can replace you with new creatures. Watch, he just made Adam and Eve. He's telling you, get in line or else. And then came, exactly. And this is the beauty, guys. This is what's so powerful about Sabbath. And then after this evidence, after these lies of, of trying to twist and turn, God says, universe, you've heard the allegations. You've seen the evidence. I rest my case. No pressure, no coercion. This time is your time. 24 hours aside, rest, consider, reflect, make up your own mind. It's up to you who you trust. Now, what does it say about God that in the context of an assault on his rulership, that instead of using power to force his way, which he had the power to do, instead of doing that, he does just the opposite. He creates a day for actual freedom to think and choose. You see, day one through six of the creation week, we learn God has power. Day seven, we learn the character of the one who wields the power. And this is critical to understand this. Satan hates the Sabbath because it would not exist if he were actually the kind of being Satan alleges, a being that coerces and pressures. Because God is a being of truth, a being of love, a being who gives real freedom, the seventh day exists. And each week it exists, its existence proves Satan a liar. That's why he hates this day. And genuine Sabbath observance is something a lot more than avoiding work and coming to class. Genuine Sabbath observance is you have the law written on the heart Thus, you are a practitioner of God's law in that you present the truth in love and you leave people free. And this is the opposite of that B system. And we've, we've heard our whole lives that the B system sets itself up against God and the beast day as opposed to the God's day and all this kind of stuff. It's ultimately, what are the methods of the B system? No one can buy or sell save him who has the mark of the beast. It's power over coercive pressure. That's the mark of the beast. It's not just which day you worship on. Those people who wanted Christ off the cross wanted him down so they could keep the wrong day of the week, right? No, it was the seventh day. Were, were, were they his friends? No, it's not just about the day. It's about the meaning. This is the beauty of it. It's about God's character as revealed in this day. So why is this day holy? Why is it holy? Some will allege, and this is how Satan takes and twists it. Okay, I can't defeat the Sabbath for some. They're going to cling to it. So what do we do? We've got to make them think it's an arbitrary test of obedience. There's no reason for it, but, but, but what God just is the ruler. He created it, and now he says, do it or else. And so now the Sabbath, rather than being, it being a day of evidence, rather than being, being a day that reveals God's character and leaves us free, now it reveals God is an imposer of law, an imposer of rules, an imposer of punishments, and it still turns God into the arbitrary being Satan alleges he is. And this is the kind of people who would rather... Um, let somebody die than heal them on Sabbath 2,000 years ago. <clears throat> Would rather get, put somebody on the cross but get them down by sunset because they, they were going to keep that imposed law. And the Sabbath gets twisted into a distorted meaning. And people still come to you today and will tell you, hey, it's going to come down to which day you worship on. If you're not worshiping on the right day, you're going to be lost. I'm going to tell you, it's going to come down to whose character you have in your heart. Either you have a love for God and love for people that will be manifested in you practicing God's methods, presenting the truth in love, leaving people free, or you're going to buy into a system where you're willing to coerce and threaten and even stone people like, Paul, like Saul of Tarsus did before he was converted in God's name. And that's really where it gets down to. Yes, Linda. So I think we should pay close attention to what Jesus does on Sabbath. Because what does he do? He recreates a man's sight, his brain and his eyes, a guy born blind. He relieves paralysis that was there for years. So in, in my perspective, he is showing spiritually 
what the Sabbath is meant to do for you. Relieve your spiritual paralysis, give you vision and sight, help you really to understand God. And even more than that, the people heal on Sabbath, these were emergency situations, life or limb, right? If we don't do it today, they're going to lose their arm. If we don't do it today, they'll be dead by tomorrow, right? These were emergency. He was working the ER. No, this was routine. This guy paralyzed 38 years. Paralyzed 38 years. He can't wait till tomorrow, right? <laughs> no. What is the implication? And, th and this is why the Jews are so mad. What are you doing? You're working on Sabbath. What did he say? My father is always at work. And so am I. What's the deal here? See, is there a dip? See, the, the, the kind of, what, when he said, thou shalt not work, you, your, 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 your manservant, maidservant, and all the strangers, and everybody else is visiting, and, and the relatives at Christmas, and everybody else, okay, you're not supposed to work on Sabbath. What was he saying? Let people die until tomorrow. No, what he's saying is, don't go out and be selfish on Sabbath. Don't go out and seek your own gain. Don't go out to profit on this day. There you go. All right, uh, day three. Day three of creation, uh, God creates the land, brings the land forth from the waters, separates the land and waters, and creates plants. Now consider, what do you think the earth was like? Okay, we already got a little kind of imaginary, sanctified imagination of, of maybe what the, what the upper atmosphere looked like, and it was kind of cool. And sure. What do you think the earth was like at this time? Like upper Quebec. Jesus, up, upper Quebec. <laughs> Cold and frigid. <laughs> Where people speak French? <laughs> Let's hope not, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. If anybody speaks French, I didn't mean it. Okay, <laughs> just joking. Okay. Yes. No, but, but wait, the question in the back. Is Zoe comment? Oh uh, yeah, Eric. A while back had um, had a question. Uh, he, he actually, let me, I just lost it. Hang on just a second. Um, could it be that God created the characteristic of matter allowing it to change the state of solid to liquid to gas? And then he uh, gave the verse, uh, Proverbs 3.20, in which I looked that up. And it said, by his knowledge, the watery depths were divided and the clouds let d drop the dew. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not following the question, honestly. Okay, well, it was, he was saying that could it be that, the, that God had the, um, the matter um, change from solid to liquid? Yeah, he, of course he designed water. To, water is fantastic. Do a little research on water. It's a fantastic molecule. And, of course, he designed water, and it does incredible things from all these different states, surely. But I, don't, I, I personally don't believe that the atmosphere we have today was the atmosphere prior to the flood. I believe wa water is water, and I think water was sim very similar before and after. But where water was and it, what it did to the atmosphere, I think, was significantly different prior to the flood than it is today, and that impacted the atmosphere, oxygen content, and so forth. So I don't think we had storms raging, tornadoes, hurricanes, and all those things were going on on the earth before the flood. The atmosphere was not like that. That, that type of atmosphere comes because that higher water layer no longer exists. And it's all down in the ocean, and the, and, the, and, the, and the energy from the sun now heats it, sending this water into the atmosphere that was not happening prior to the flood, in my, in my view. So what, let's look at the earth, the actual earth. Before the flood, before the upheaval, before the, 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 the you know, the, do you think the gold and the platinum and the jewels were all buried deep in the earth before the flood? Or do you think God is creator... And, if, and if, if there's scripture to support what I'm about to hypothesize and fantasize here about, okay? How's, how's the New Jerusalem described? Streets of? Yeah, and, and gates of? And foundations of? Okay, so I'm suggesting that when God created, he created things beautiful. And he used these elements to, to and, and so in, in, instead of a riverbed being mud and dirt, God's riverbeds are made out of Diamonds and platinum and, and emeralds and sapphires and, and gold and, and, and rubies and, and, and all these different, can, can you imagine the waterfall following over a, a riverbed like this and then the shimmering sun and the kaleidoscope of colors. And the, I mean, you get some imagery of this kind of close when you, see, when you hear about how in, the, in the, uh, uh, the book of Revelation where the throne sits on a crystal plane. 
and, the, and, 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 and it describes the, the, shimmering, the shimmering stones of emerald and, and ruby that, that were around and the, and, the, and the rainbow, which is like an emerald ruby rainbow that is over the, the, the throne in Revelation. Do you, do you think earth had some of this stuff going on? I do. I think it was like this. I think it's beyond our capacity to know. But here's a description of a book I like called Patri- Patriarchs and Prophets, page 90. <clears throat> and this is after sin, before flood. In the days of Noah, a double curse was resting upon the earth in consequence of Adam's transgression and the murder of, committed by Cain. Yet this had not greatly changed the face of nature. There were evident tokens of decay, but the earth was still rich and beautiful in the gifts of God's providence. The hills were crowned with majestic trees supporting the fruit-laden branches of the vine. The vast garden-like plains were clothed with verdure. It's like really thick green stuff. Um, and, and sweet with fragrance of a thousand flowers. The fruits of the earth were in great variety and almost without limit. The trees far surpassed in size, beauty, and perfection, uh, and perfect proportion, any now to be found. Their wood was a fine grade and a hard substance closely resembling stone. Do you think some of the petrified wood we found is actually pre-flood trees? Hmm. And hardly less enduring than stone. Gold, silver, and precious stones existed in abundance. Think about what the earth looked like. It's fantastic to just imagine. I, I'm looking forward to seeing it may do, aren't you? Do you think our, our vision is dulled? When you go, when you, you know, any, anybody ever you know, travel to the Rockies or places like this? And you look at, do you find the mountains beautiful? I mean, we are there, we go skiing, we get our camera, the beautiful blue, brilliant sky, the wonderful, gorgeous looking mountains and, and uh, so forth. But let me read you this out of Spiritual Gifts, volume 3, page 33. When God had formed the earth, there were mountains, hills and plains, and interspersed among them were rivers and bodies of water. The earth was not one extensive plain, but the monotony of the scenery was broken up by hills and mountains, not high and ragged as they are now, but regular and beautiful in shape. The bare, high rocks were never seen upon them, but lay beneath the surface, answering as bones to the earth. So we think it's beautiful. How many think if you come up a car wreck and see somebody's femur sticking out their leg, you go, man, that's so beautiful. (laughs) Okay? These rag- ragged, sharp-edged mountains that we see, and we look how beautiful, the answer is bones to the earth. What does it say about our vision, our perspective? What was mentioned earlier about how dark it is and how dark our vision is. I mean, we, do, do, do we have even an awareness of how little we take as beauty? What we're willing to sell our souls for? The cheap little trinkets of earth. I, I, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered in the heart of man. I, as much as my imagination has gone crazy here today, and maybe you caught a glimpse of that, it's still dark. It's still pitiful compared to what God has in store for us. And on Thursday's lesson, look, at, you, look how I'm cruising. We're on Thursday, guys. <laughs> The lesson asks us to read 2 Corinthians 4, 6. I'm going to start with 1 and go through 6. Therefore, since, God, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception. Notice what we've renounced. We're not using the ways of deceit. We're not using deception. Nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth, plainly we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled... It is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of men so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is in the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let the light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Boy, I wish we had time to really unpack this, but we got like three minutes, so I'm going to just run through some high points here. Notice the context. He's saying we aren't liars. We, we love the truth. We fight against lies. That's what he's saying. However, the truth about God is not understood by those whose minds are darkened by Satan. And Satan is the father of? And, he, and, he, then, he gives a, and then he uses a metaphor. What metaphor does he use to describe this process? A veil. A veil covers their, their minds, is what he says. And so what, is, what metaphorical symbol, symbolism is he drawing from? 
tabernacle. The tabernacle, the Old Testament sanctuary service. And their minds were veiled. Now, I'm going to just walk you through it really quick. The holy place of the Old Testament sanctuary is symbolic of the holy place, symbolic of the church. It's all lined with gold, okay? We are supposed to buy from Christ gold tried in the fire. Our hearts are to be renewed as gold and silver. Um, as it says in uh, Malachi chapter 3, that he cleanses the Levites or washes them like gold and silver, okay? They're the lamp, which is the, thy word is a lamp. So we have the word of God. We have the, every Sabbath, the priest in their white robes. White robes represent? Yes. Righteousness of Christ. So these renewed people who love Christ come together every Sabbath and, and eat the showbread. And only the priest could come in the holy place every Sabbath, eat the showbread. The showbread is? Yes. I am the bread of heaven, manna that come down from heaven, Jesus said. They're partaking of Jesus Christ, ingesting his character every week. The golden altar represents the heart, of the renewed heart of the believers who offer prayers up to God. See, the, the, the incense of prayers didn't go on the brazen altar. That's, that's an unconverted heart. The converted heart, this is where prayers go up for God. So we're, the church is symbolized here. And we gather together in our white robes to partake of Christ. And we long to see God. We look to see God. But something, we're in the, literally there now. Something's blocking our way. We can't see into the most holy place. What's in our way? A veil. What's on the veil? Angels. Angels are on the veil. Wait a minute. Okay, wait. Who's Satan? What kind of being? And he's the father of? Lies. Angelic lies. Satan's lies have obstructed our view of God. In Christ at the cross, when he died, he destroyed those lies and the veil was rent and our view of God is now open. We can see him clearly. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Fantastic imagery. So if you read this, uh, this verse again, go back and it says the light emanating from Jesus Christ. We can see the light of the glory of God because of Jesus Christ and our minds are no longer veiled. But those who have bought into Satan's lies, their minds are veiled and they can't see the light of the glory of God. Our gracious heavenly father, we thank you so much that you have not left us in darkness, that you have come to bring us the truth about your character, your kingdom, your methods, your principles of love. There's so many preconceived ideas, so many many beliefs that we've held that have confused us, Lord, and we ask that your spirit will help connect the dots, that we can see the clear picture of your kingdom, the clear picture of your character, that we can know you. We open our hearts and ask your spirit to come in, to write the law of love upon our hearts and minds, that we might be true keepers of your day, people who live lives of truth presented in love, leaving people free. Lights into this world, Lord, that you might come soon. We pray in your holy name. Amen.